Bonsoir, madame, monsieur. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the live Q&A for the gobsmacking science fiction tone poem that is come true. You were the first audience in the world to see this film. I trust you loved it as much as I did. Uh, I'm thrilled now to introduce to you an array of amazing talents uh, we have with us tonight writer, director, cinematographer, and composer, Anthony Scott Burns. We have actors, Julia Sarah Stone, Landon LeBoiron, Carly Reisky, co-producer Nicola Bechard, production supervisor, Howard Gordon, executive producer, Vincenzo Natale, and producer, <laughs> Mark Smith. Welcome, everyone. Hey. Hey. <laughs> so... <laughs> So first, congratulations. Anthony, it must be a relief that Come True now lives. It is a huge relief. Sorry, man. <laughs> this is uh, Howard Gordon. <laughs> what? Uh, Howard Gordon does not usually does look, look this way. And his new look is really, really, it's, it's, it's making us happy. <laughs> so hang on, it's, I've never met Howard. I have no clue, like as a reference point. <laughs> I, I'm presuming that he's just not there? No, no, Howard's there, he's there. He just, he's the uh, samurai he that's arrived. Us with a great <laughs> Thank you, Howard. Okay. Fair enough. Yes. <laughs> All right, Anthony, uh, do you want to talk a bit about the genesis of the project? I know that the original uh, writing process began way before you'd imagine making a film with it, uh, with your early experiences with sleep paralysis. Yeah, uh, the movie, the movie, the movie came for, uh, to me from, uh, you know, a lot of personal experiences, but also from a want and a desire to, to, I don't know, to make a horror film that that came from, from something that was real. Uh, a lot of my films, uh, they sort of, the genesis for most of the stories that I tell come from something that you know. I, I like to think of technology meeting with ritual mm. or, 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 or things that are uh, ancient and something, you know, like our house is very similar in that the, the story comes from, uh, you know, it's just stuff that to me, that the stuff that really, really intrigues me is how uh, ancient energies intertwine with technology and how technology just doesn't care. And so for me, as I saw this thing with Berkeley, you know, Berkeley's developing this technology to, to, you know, see what our minds see. As soon as I saw that, that video, it was, it was, I think about five years ago, the first thing I thought of is, well, can we see dreams? And when are we gonna see dreams? And so that was the, that was the, the impetus for this movie. And, and honestly, <laughs> that's really all I have to say. No, that's right fair, now. that's, that's yeah. good. Yeah, it, it, and, I, and I actually thought I thought the same thing when I first heard of that technology. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 one of it's where all, all my movies come from. I'll see something on YouTube or in Gadget or something, and go, "What's the horror behind this? Or how how's it going to affect us horrifically?" And so mm -hmm. everything <laughs> I ever come up with is from. I, I think my my main fear is technology and our willingness to dive off uh, the, the you know into the deep end of whatever it is that's coming down the pipe. Mm -hmm. so. And now now not even really bothering with testing. You yes. know, there's, there's so many new things coming through that haven't even been proven to be safe yet. In, in, you know, I, I feel the same way about cinema. And I think it, it's... <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> but cinema shouldn't be safe, <laughs> in my mind. I'm saying in terms of how we see cinema, mm. you know, we, we all, we got our smartphones, uh, you know, a while back and, and we haven't seen the, the edge of the cliff yet, but you know, you feel it as someone who makes cinema, we don't know where it's headed. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so, so I think my fear of technology probably comes from the way that it encroaches on the cinematic process. No, but that makes sense. And technology has made it so that people now are, are no longer, they, they resent the idea of submitting to cinema the way that we did when we grew up. The idea that you know if the film's going to begin at eight p.m. and you come at eight fifteen, it began fifteen minutes without you. You know, it did not wait for you, mm -hmm. uh, and it won't pause for you. And you have to you won't maybe it won't spoon feed you, and you have to catch up with it. 
Exactly. Uh, I feel like people nowadays are, are yeah, they've become so, so lazy about things. And there's so many options that are literally on demand that the very moment they hit play, the first frame drops, well, uh, that they don't really want to, they don't see cinema as a sacred experience the way, uh, the way many of us grew up seeing it. Well, I mean, and I do blame technology for that, even though it's also made so much art so much more accessible, both in terms of awareness and actual availability of the pieces. Yeah, no, no, you're exactly right. Again, that's where the fear comes for us, is, is, is that, you know, what you're talking about is, is something we talk about a lot as filmmakers, is that uh, when you grow, I mean, I don't want to feel like a really old man, but <laughs> it's the truth, uh, is when you, when you end up renting the same video over and over and over, or you can only afford one video cassette, that's the one that's on and, and you sort of, uh, you, you learn from the repeat watches and you, and you, and you gain a value from sort of having to spend your hard earned dollars on, on, on a piece of media. And it, that relationship definitely does freak me out. Mm -hmm. well, fair. Now you, you've said that um, particularly the character of Sarah is emotionally autobiographical to you in many ways. Would you like to speak to that? Uh, <laughs> I guess so. Uh, uh, sorry, Mitch, I'm just so bad at this. Uh, I, I, no, don't worry. It's truly inorganic and awkward to do Q and A's this way. I more than sympathize. I've been awkward and uncomfortable for the last ten days. <laughs> so, be, by all means, be be awkward and don't be self conscious about it. If anyone, by the way, if everyone here wants to jump in and speak, please do jump in over me whenever you want. Except how? Yeah. Howard uh, <laughs> Howard has lost his his speaking. Uh, privileges. Uh, right. So, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, do you want to talk about the character? You don't have to. Well, well, okay. For me, Sarah, you know, mirrors a lot of my feelings and and the things that were going on for me. I didn't grow up uh, in a in a in a well-off household. And I had a lot of problems. My mother passed away when I was very young. And so I, uh, I think much like Sarah, she doesn't have, uh, she only has one parent. And just a single parent household when you're struggling to survive, just a lot of tension. And I used to end up being away from the house a lot and having sort of explosive emotions due to, to trauma, early, early childhood trauma. And, and so I just wanted to, Sarah was written as, as someone who is at the end of the rope and needs to go into this, this world. And for me, when I'm writing a horror narrative, especially in this case, um, you know, I often question when people join something in a horror movie or join a group or do whatever it is they do. Yeah. Uh, I find it, it, it's seldom unmotivated. Yeah. It's, it's seldom I motivated, find, I mean to say, yeah. I find it very necessary to make sure that the character is intelligent and it's doing things for reasons that people would understand or would do themselves, or may not understand right off why they're doing it, but as you get to know the character, they get there. Mm -hmm. uh, so a question then for Julia, uh, with your interpretation of the character, first of all, how early into the project did you come on? Because it feels like it was something written for you. I don't know if that's the case. Uh, no, I, I don't think it's the case. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's just like the fact that he, that, you know, the character's name is your middle name. I mean, that, yeah, that is, that is just an, a weird coincidence. Um, I think, unless Anthony, you're hiding something from me. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually been following you for years. <laughs> it wasn't written for her, but the minute I'm, I'm, I talked to her and we spoke about the project, it, I knew that no one else could play her, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does. Because she's perfect. You're perfect in the role. You're so great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. The character really. Um, I was I was drawn to her. I think uh, because of the way that Anthony wrote her, and and um, that she's such an active person in her own. Um, she she creates her own story rather than being the victim of it, um, or 100%. just the victim of it. Yeah. yeah. So it's not a reactive character. Mm -hmm, for sense. sure. Yeah. Yeah. She's 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 very much uh, the doer in the story, and uh, yeah, I I think um, that intelligence and that it's 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 not common in especially a female protagonist of 
uh, a thriller or a or in a movie uh, of this genre. So, yeah, that really that really stood out to me and and made me uh, interested in and in wanting to um, wanting to work with it. Yeah, fantastic. Did yeah. he play any of the score for you before the film was shot or during production? Uh, I would get like tidbits of it while it. the score was being created. And I had, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So had, that was very exciting to like. I had such a sense of that. The way you use your eyes, the way you move in the frame mm -hmm. uh, really feels like, I mean, that or he's, you know, obviously Anthony's a very empathetic artist uh, or he just scored it incredibly after the fact to your movements. But it really felt like, like yeah, like, like that was guiding you in a lot of ways. That's yeah, and I think, yeah, and I think all of us, um, all of us working on it, were very much on the same page uh, with the tone and the feel of the movie. Um, and I think that, I mean, that obviously would organically happen with such a such a small team of people and mm -hmm. working for so long together. <laughs> what was the shoot? Yeah, so it, it it happened very uh, very naturally, I think. Cool. How long was the shoot? Oh my gosh, it uh, sixty days. Yeah, yeah it's actually quite luxurious for an independent film. Mm -hmm. Twenty years. It was twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we, were in, we were in Edmonton in the sixty dead of days were 20, for 20, twenty years <laughs> in Ontario years. Yeah. <laughs> no, I did. We scheduled, we scheduled it that way, Mitch, so that so that. I knew that if we were doing a budget film, we had to figure out a way to get time because having done you know enough projects to see where where we really needed the time together to to, to get the performances and to get the vibe right, and you know, it 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 was it was it was very easy with the cast we had because they were so great, but it was always fun to have that time because then we could play. And I think that's the thing is that we got you know we would get the take on you know one two three, but then we we play around and try things different ways. And I think it was a lot of fun to have that time. So although it was long, but it was <laughs> right. <laughs> and it lends a real sense of intimacy, I think, in the performances and the yeah. general atmosphere of the film. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 that's my favorite part. That's my favorite part is, is once, you know, a lot of people would think that the technical stuff or, 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 you know, sort of planning and shooting and stuff for me, sitting, in, looking through the lens, that's the best part. Mm -hmm. so I like to do that as much as I can. Now, as a cinematographer, and you you operated as well, right? Beautiful. Um, so, do you want to talk about how, just in terms of capturing the kind of imagery that you did, uh, and really yeah. keeping a consistent tone of it, almost feeling like a dream transcription, which which I've not seen in many films, uh, certainly not as compellingly done as here. Thank you, Cooper. <laughs> yes, canine interjections are perfect. <laughs> Always a fan. <laughs> um, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm so bad at answering these questions because I think I, I'm someone who, who I don't know how to explain it better than I instinctually shoot. Mm -hmm. um, I, That's a fine not, explanation. Yeah, there's, there's not a lot of rhyme and reason other than I know that it will feel right because I have the whole movie in my head. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to, and, and there are moments when I was editing the movie when I would get sort of weird and teary and I'd bring my wife in and show her the cut and, and, and I would say to her, this is as close to what I had in my mind that, that I've ever gotten to. And, and I was so excited by this film because of that. And mm -hmm. it was, as we should be. So I don't, I don't tend, I don't often storyboard. I, I sort of- I was going to ask that, okay. I know it's it's weird because it seems storyboarded. <laughs> it, it feels well. There's such a specificity to all the images. Is it just yeah. that your memory is is tight? Because you mentioned having a photographic memory for other films shot lists. Uh, you didn't you didn't say it today, but you said that in the past. Yeah. Um, so was it that that you you break it down and remember how you want to do it to such a T that you don't really need to have documentation? Most important, yeah. Well, it's sort of like I'll I'll remember the emotion something gave me in the past. Yeah. And I'll use that as the, the touching point to how, sort of how we'll approach the scene. And then if it's not working, we'll approach it in a different way. But that's the starting point is that something in the past had worked and gave me that feeling. Because that's really yeah. what the movies are always about. Is it's about 100%. Yes. All of that's from our own experiences of imagery that all becomes emotional shorthand. 100%. Yeah. Excellent. Do you want to talk about composing the score? 
which I amazing score. I adore the score of this film. I know I emailed you about it already when I first saw it, but <laughs> let's, let's we basically have the same answer. Sorry? I was gonna say, let's let someone else talk about something. Oh, get to it. But you've done like 90 jobs on this movie. <laughs> it's sort of inevitable. <laughs> I would otherwise be talking to the composer, but the composer is also oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will get to the rest of the cast and the producers, I promise. So, so the score, the score for me, again, music is 80% of the emotionality of a piece. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Some people will strongly disagree, but for me, 80% of the emotionality, like if we have the very same performance and the very same editing and I put in some library track, it's over. It's just yep. over, like it doesn't work. So the score is really important. Um, uh, I will usually, so on this one, obviously we have the amazing uh, music of Electric Youth joining me as well. And they were yeah. sort of involved early on. And we both sort of decided to take certain tonal parts of the film um, and I had done some remixes for them years ago. Um, that Modern Fears remix is just immaculate. Yeah. Um, so I did that one because uh, we're friends and it was just sort of like we we're doing, you know, playing around and doing stuff. And as soon as I wrote that one, I think I, I reached up and, and I said, I think we should just belong to come true, this thing that I'm working on right now. And we got to talking and, and so, so really they, they went off and they, they wrote some tonal pieces and I went off and I wrote some tonal pieces and then together we sort of came together and they put together some stuff for certain scenes and I did, so it's sort of, it was really great collaboration. And then I ended up sort of, we ended up recutting the film a lot. And so um, many of their beautiful tracks didn't even, because it's the first cut of this film, because I shot it, I became in love with a lot of things. <laughs> it happens, yeah. <laughs> And and we had we had a quite a long director's cut. Um, and How long was the first cut? Uh, Mark, two know, hours, right? two hours and fifteen. I want to say no. That's actually not back. crazy. Two two forty, I believe. Two forty is more crazy. Okay, yeah, okay. would still work, I think, for the spine of the film. But yeah, that's more what a first cut often could be. And so that's the cut that they wrote to, and I wrote to, and. Mm. Uh, ultimately, a lot of the stuff that they worked on with me was the more emotional first half of the film. And, you know, just as you do, you, you distill the film down. And so a lot of the, the stuff didn't end up, but they have made some of the most beautiful music and I can't wait for you guys to hear it. Um, but, but um, and there's still some really great things in there, like um, in the hospital sequence and all the remixes and um, yeah, it was, it, it's weird because, you know, again, just like the cinematography, I don't really know what to say about the creation of the stuff. It just comes out of us. And I think it's the same for Electric Youth and I, we just sort of, we watch the film and, and it just comes out as it does. And there's not really a lot of thought put into it. I, I, I know it sounds. No, no, no. It's, it's emotion over logic. The best art is a triumph of emotion over logic, I think. And, and that's the thing that it just, I'm trying, we're trying, we're working together to try and pull out emotions. Um, and, and Electric Youth and I did that, you know, we work together to try and do that. I love our collaboration, our cover, our cover of uh, Cola Kent by Shriekback. Um, we work together to pull out an emotion. And uh, yeah, I, I, that's why I'm terrible at explaining these things is, is that, that for me, a lot of it is just instinct. And I've yeah. just had this, I've been lucky enough to have this sort of drive and, and want to do these things and lucky enough to be able to do them. And there's, for, for me to say like where, 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 how I come up with the comp compositions, I would have to say just luck. <laughs> Cause they instinct. just come out. It's, 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 like, it's yeah. instinct and intuition. Yeah, yeah. But I will say, I, I love the way it's spotted through the film. The fact that the movie is almost wall to wall music and sound design. Like I, I feel the score in this film plays, but that's a great thing. It doesn't work for all films, obviously. Depends what you're going for, but um, you know, I, I personally struggle with that. You know, when I'm thinking about how I'm spotting the film, but I can't help it. There are music videos that were in my head. <laughs> like, <laughs> ways, like, like but they, but also cre it creates an emotional coherence to it. I think too, mm -hmm. and a certain dreamy consistency. 
that yeah, if you just went with room tones for, for big parts of the film, it would still work. The performances are so compelling and the visuals are so strong. Yeah. But I think that music, it's almost the way Tangerine Dream used to approach their scores in, in the late seventies and early eighties, you know? Well, electric, we talk a lot about that, you know? Obviously you can hear that there, there's definitely influence from Tangerine Dream. Big time, um, yeah. We, and, but yeah, it, it, it is what it is. Like I can't help myself but write music to these scenes. And I, you know, maybe I, if I was a more disciplined artist, I would, but. No. <laughs> it, you're it, it, you're you know, as disciplined as you need works. to be to make good art. Thank but, you. <laughs> yes, you're very welcome. Okay, so moving to Landon and Carly, do you want to talk about your approaches to Jeremy and Anita? Yes, you're off the hot seat. <laughs> Go for it, Landon. <laughs> uh, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's I um, was immediately interested in Jeremy by the the script, and um, I mean, he was already sort of he was already sort of there. It's it's funny, Anthony. And I talked to I, th I think Anthony. And I uh, at the beginning saw different versions of him that eventually kind of morphed into one version you know mm, yeah true. that's true it, it was it was he was he was meaner <laughs> you were meaner i think it, i think he was cooler totally jerkish and i think that what what landon brought was it was a depth that was really important you know like because you liked jeremy more now and mm. so when he did certain things and made certain decisions it was harder to sort of navigate what was up with him. And I think that was a really smart and strong decision, so. Yeah. That's what I, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And Landon, I must, I must compliment you on the Freak's half sheet behind you. The what? Oh. The Freak's half sheet behind you. Yeah, Gooba Gaba, you know? <laughs> yes, absolutely, one of us. I'm drowning for the win. <laughs> but yeah, um, okay, uh, sorry, Carly. Yeah, um, I remember first getting the audition sides for Anita and reading through them and then just being so co like conversational but easy. I remember reading through them and I was like, oh yeah, this feels human. This feels really mm -hmm. smart. This feels really, I don't know. Um, everything came very, I don't know, smoothly. I didn't have to fight really hard with it. And then once I got to know Anita, it was like, I loved how smart she was. I loved how she loved what she does, science, yeah. and she had this goal, and she had all these feelings, but she didn't let all of the obstacles that were in her way get in the way of her goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I just, her, her smarts are what, uh, what got it, me. Did you do any institutional work uh, in the past? Were you able to draw? Um, I was able to tour a few facilities. Ooh, I did nice. Of, like, yeah, I, knew, I know some med students, so I kind of just, did my research with them and I got a lot, of, I got to tour a lot of labs. So mm -hmm. that was helpful for me. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of really got me into what we have done. So. Cool. Yeah. Oh, great work. Yeah. Um, so moving on to Mark, Vincenzo and Howard. Um, well, actually, sorry, Howard, your production supervisor. I'll get to you after. Uh, Vincenzo, Mark and Nicola. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, can you talk a bit about mounting the production? And whether it's, you know, getting telephone involved, just getting the film made on the scale. Yeah, I mean, um, Vincenzo and Anthony were friends for a long time. I let Vincenzo speak to that. But, you know, the deal with Anthony was if you do an Anthony Scott Burns film, it's his movie in the sense mm -hmm. that he, you know, he can only make it one way and you either have to get on board or he shouldn't be involved. Yep. So, and Steve Hoban, who's our other producer, is not here. He's on vacation right now. Um, we just said, you know, yeah. this, this works on vacation, this type you know, of thing. Yeah, I know he's, he, he's, he's hiking somewhere. There, there's no, there's no. Okay, uh, I think, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but we, we, we just, we just, we just went with it and, and said, okay, let's, let's, let's drink the Kool-Aid and let Anthony do how Anthony works. And that is 60 day shoot, the tiniest budget we could cobble together. And we, final did, cut. Yep. Oh, good. Yeah, good, yeah, good. Cut from the, Everything. It so, feels it. I mean, it really feels yeah. like there's a purity of vision in the film. Yeah. No, pretty yeah. uncommon. Yeah. And, and again, in, in a lot of ways, we should not have been allowed to make this movie. You know, like it's. At the budget <laughs> class you did, though, you should. It, it makes sense. No, I know. It's not conventionally, but it will in the marketplace. I, 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 I just, I just mean, I just mean in the world of unions and how yeah. it works, 
we had a little less than a million dollars and we again put it all on the screen i say we it's really anthony and nick they're out there in edmonton with our with our cast and, and crew of four an mm. hour sorry um but yeah and but telefilm was supportive they 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 also drank the kool-aid and said yep let's let very happy to see that yeah raven banner as well all the partners so and again we we had no doubt anthony would would deliver an amazing film we're really happy but we've never done that before gone in that blind so it was exciting and scary at the same time excellent i'm glad it was rewarding it was it was so vincenza as one of uh you know the the modern godfathers of canadian genre film uh do you want to speak to what it is that attracts you to anthony's work i'm jealous of him <laughs> <laughs> i think anthony is as we all know is astoundingly talented um in many many disciplines and um no i it's not that. I, I, I was introduced to Anthony's work actually on the Twitch website, um, courtesy of Todd Brown. I just saw some of his stuff and I, I just instantly saw what he could do and what he could potentially be. And then I noticed that he was from Toronto and I've never done this before, but I, I just called him. You cold called him. <laughs> right on. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> which is a little weird, I guess, but, um, uh, so you know we what's that i said i'm glad you did <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah <clears throat> so uh and then from that point i've just watched anthony do one amazing thing after another and um uh you know i'm i didn't do anything on this film. i'm just the, i'm the executive cheerleader that's all i do is just kind of you know <laughs> shake the pom-poms from time to time for sure um, but, but it was very get films to the finish line well, and they get yeah, guess, yeah, it's nice to have them around. I, it's an important usually, position. usually, usually they're nicer to look at. But um, anyway, <laughs> I really, uh, I really lived vicariously through Anthony and Nick and everyone involved with the movie. Like it was very exciting from the sidelines to watch them conjure this thing from you know virtually nothing. Like they built mm. the sets, they painted the sets, they put, they found the costume. They did like it's, it is, it's a very beautiful thing to see a small group of people put together a production that is absolutely um, on the level of any movie out there. Yeah. It with, with anything. With anything. And I'm, I've done, I've said this so many times, I'm sure it's annoying, Anthony, but I like to borrow William Gibson's um, term, the garage Kubrick <laughs> to describe Anthony because he, you know, but it really does because he, he, you know, he pulls, all these resources and all these people together. I mean, you can tell everyone's very devoted to him because he's such a lovely person too. And, um, but, and, and he, you know, we've seen other filmmakers do that, but rarely do we see a filmmaker put all of those various components together to such a high degree of perfection. I mean, it is Kubrickian in that respect. And, right. um, and, and so that was just- who would see yeah. the best way. Yeah, it's very exciting to see. And uh, I'm so happy we're here today because um, it's been a long journey. Great, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it, it, what is it, three years since we shot, guys? Yeah, we were yeah. shooting uh, probably the school scenes at this three, time three, three years, years ago. ago. Yeah. yeah. Mm. All right, um, so Howard Gordon, production supervisor. What was it like trying to keep this on track for 60 days? Um, yeah, it's funny what Vincenzo said of how he feels like he really didn't do too much because even though I was there every day and we were grinding day and day, I feel like I didn't do anything either because we were sort of clearing <laughs> the way for Anthony to do everything because he's such a unique, incredible talent. So it, it, it's surprisingly for how arduous the Edmonton can be in those times. It was so smooth. That's right. You guys shot in Edmonton, eh? Yeah, it was Edmonton. Yeah. Edmonton right yeah. <laughs> it was actually smooth sailing. It was, it was shockingly smooth. <laughs> Fantastic. Cool. Um, now, hang on. I've had notes. There was a beautiful Anthony. I know you hate talking at this point, but I, mean, I, I just... Well, listen, once you got me going, I'm okay. There was okay, cool. Like, uh... Yeah, I totally get that. I, 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 again, I'm awkward about this stuff as well. You know, I mean, like, I'm loving this, but like, it's always doing it like this through, um, through the, the cyber webs is super weird for everybody. Um, so you have a beautiful, beautiful quote uh, talking about Asperger's syndrome in relation to the creative process. And I was so touched by it. So to quote you in depth, but it's worth quoting the whole piece, I think. 
you said, my films are not made just to tell a story. My movies are how I speak. Making movies and music are the best way I know how to effectively communicate with neurotypical people. Asperger's allows me to distill the elements of cinema into emotion and a kind of interpersonal communication. And I, I was so touched by that. I just wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Uh, in, is that really the final word? Because that's cool too, if you're not comfortable with it. Well, no, I don't want to put you on any kind of hot seat. What would you like to know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, just, okay, just more like, I mean, how that, how this affects you, like when you're, when you're working creatively uh, and, you're, and you're communicating with your actors specifically, how do you want them to move through a shot? Uh, how do you want them to feel about a moment? Well, um, I mean, a lot of it is just instinctive, I'm sure, and probably maybe, impossible maybe, to explain. Maybe everyone here can 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 sort of speak to that. Uh, I I tend to be okay on set. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I'm sure you are. You're, there's no, no question of that. I get, once I get once I get in the zone, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm okay. It's I know. Like getting there, that like I was in a trance for the first five minutes of this. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And, and it really is about getting my focus back. Yeah. And and but but when it comes to directing actors, I I don't know, guys. I <laughs> I'm sure you're fantastic. I mean, I think what I meant to ask more than is your perspective to performance and, and working with actors. Oh, let them do their job. Get people who are great and let them do their job. Like like I really you know talking about the character of Jeremy or, or, or Sarah or Anita, it, we do a rigorous casting process. Like we, that's one of our big things that we do when we're doing, you know, these movies is we go through a lot of people until we find the exact right person. That's and what you so have to do. Way, really, I don't have to do anything except figure out the blocking. And, and blocking is a big thing for us too, is where I don't set up the camp. That's the other reason I'm not really a storyboard person is I know what I need to get to tell the story, but if it doesn't feel right for the actors, you feel mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. So I let them, like, let's go through the scene and we'll, and we'll figure out how this should move and how they would walk and how they would do this. And then the camera comes and we figure it out. But I don't do it like, this is the shot, you gotta do this and your finger goes here and touches that. Like, yeah. It freezes time. people out when you do that. Yeah, when it's very necessary to tell a story, we'll do that. But other than that, so my philosophy is get a great cast. <laughs> Which we did, yes. And you did that, yes, <laughs> most definitely. Uh, so let's open up some questions from the audience. Uh, to you out there, it is weird, but there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Find it, tap it, and type things into it. Uh, I will read them out. I will give voice to your typing. Um, and then these wonderful people will answer some of your questions. So I see we already have some that are here. Uh, from Terry, the score was amazing as well as the sounds. Which decade did you get your influence from? Because it has a very strong 80s vibe. Thank you for your time. I guess that's for me, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's what it goes in the territory of being a multi hyphenate. Well, you know, just like the film uh, itself, yeah. the score comes from all decades. You know, like it. It might have some 80s elements because of their synthesizers and stuff in there, but I don't know about you guys, but I feel like it, it's you. If you went back to the 80s and dropped this off, they'd be weirded out by it. And so it has it has elements of things that we we it's 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 a merge of all the things that that I love about film score in general. And so, but definitely, obviously, I grew up in the 80s, so and I mean, John Carpenter is a huge inspiration, even though it probably doesn't sound like John Carpenter music. No, it does in places. I mean, evocative. It doesn't sound like it does like a lift, but it sounds. It's clearly like. I mean, yeah. any modern electronic scoring has elements of Carpenter, Marauder, Tangerine Dream. Yeah. I think inevitably. I mean, it's what we've all grown up with. It's funny because I've been, I've been writing '80s '80s music for for a long time now, and it's uh, it's one of those things where I started to get into it because there's something about synthesizers. It's an instrument that can give an emotion that I don't think other, you know, so Agreed. outside of the eighties, you know, sound, just the minute you use a synthesizer, it gives a different emotion. And I think that that's what draws me to it. It's not just the nostalgic factor of it. Yeah. All right. Uh, so from Mustafa, I couldn't help but notice all the references to Young and or Tool, Philip K. Dick, 
and what looked like references to shared nightmares and maybe even the Russian sleep experiment creepypasta. How much of this was intentional and so was intended to call that this, sorry, and, and so was intended to call that this was a coma dream all along and was some of the intended messaging lost along the way of making the film? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay, that's a lot to That's a lot. Yeah, there was, there was, yeah. Um, uh, okay, let's start from the first section. What's the first section? We're okay, so the first section was, yeah, a uh, reference to Young and or Tool, Philip K. Dick, and maybe it looked like reference to shared nightmares. Uh, sure. Sure. How, okay. yeah, so how much of all that was intentional? And and so intended to call that this was a dream, a coma all along. Right, so would it be that the character would, would have already had that knowledge of all of these different things that the movie might be referencing? And that can explain why she was in a coma, that she would be, um, you know, visualizing all of this stuff in a subconscious state. Well, if that's you, actually a great, that's a really, really yeah, good question. Yeah, no, exactly, once we got through it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you well, know, it's just because it was two questions together. Yeah, but that, that part really makes sense. And then, yeah, and he was asking, and was some of that intended messaging lost along the way? I get what he means now entirely, yeah. Well, it doesn't feel lost along the way, but I'm just saying that, like, yeah, I think he meant, like, was that going to be a more concrete point at one point, perhaps? Well, it's in there as much as it's needed to be in there for people to figure things out. That's that's how I feel about it. And, and in terms of Carl Jung, of yeah, of course, it's, it's, it's the, the reason sh we're seeing all this stuff. Well, I'm not going to, I don't want to explain the movie. <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. and, that's, and I'll mention this to the audience as well. Uh, the ambiguity of the film is a very strong part of its power. So I think it would be good to keep away to refrain from interpretive questions as much as we can. Well, interpretive questions are fine. I, I, think, I think this person uh, has, has, has figured out a lot of the, the there's a lot of stuff to unpack in the film itself and i think that uh they're they're on the right track okay yeah so from kagalin roy uh julie can you talk a little bit a little bit about the process of preparing and filming seizure scenes panic attacks going into shock oh um <laughs> okay uh yeah i had part of it was experience um yeah i I think I have, I don't know. I, I, I think part of it is part of the, what creates the ability to bring up that kind of uh, physiological experience um, and to experience it in a, in a way that feels psychologically safe um, is when there's such a supportive team. Uh, and definitely, like, I, I felt very safe and supported in, um, yeah, the, the environment that Anthony created as, as a director. And, um, yeah, it's, I, and I, I have a, I have some sort of separation from the emotions and, and the experiences that Sarah is having as a character um, versus myself when, uh, after the scene is over and, um Although, although the emotions are happening and the, the experience is happening physically in, in my body, they don't, they don't belong to me after, after cut. It's, um, that, was, that was the character, that was her world, and now I'm safe. So yeah, I think it's, um, a lot of it is practice. A lot of it is having felt those, those physiological uh, experiences in my personal life. Um, yeah, and and Anthony being so great and creating that safe environment. Okay, that was great, thanks. Um, so Sean Kelly asked, how did you produce the horrific dream world landscapes and how influenced by Silent Hill were you? Uh, well, we, we made the dreamscapes all in CG. Um, there was a small team of us. Uh, I was directing it and I had my good friend Ash Thorpe on board who's a production designer and a fellow named Francois and Olaf Lomeris and Connor Greville. And we all sort of built asset. I like to approach my visual effects like a toy set. 
Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah it, it, it froze for a millisecond. Okay. Um, and, and so I like to create, so the dreams are built of icons, obviously. And, and what I would do is I would have my good friends build elements here and there, and, and I would create these sets and I would animate and, and sort of try and create a vibe um, based on dreams I've had. And we, so we would sort of storyboard all this stuff out. This is where we storyboarded, and this is where we built out icon. You know, like well, the pure VFX set pieces. That's different. It makes sense to storyboard. For exactly, that. but I still approach them like a toy set. So, so mm. when I had a great group of talented artists working with me, and we would create these little trinkets and things to put into these universes that I, I needed, and then I would populate that stuff, and we, we, you know, and then I would go off and animate these sequences into, into what they are now. But um, yeah fully CG and, and just, yeah. <laughs> uh, how influenced were they, were they by Silent Hill? I'm sure they are because I grew up playing those games and, and that's sort of the whole point of the dreams in general. Um, and that's sort of when, as artists, when we were building this stuff out, it's pulling these icons and images from our lives that end up in the dreams and sort of end up in all of our dreams. And that's the idea is that there is something to the Carl Jung thing that, that the fellow was saying before is that unfortunately we are all seeing a lot of the same things. So. <laughs> that was a good answer. Okay. I'm not gonna ask that question. <laughs> <You> jerk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, there's, there's a question is what does it mean? But I feel like we should avoid that. Like, no offense to you. <laughs> no, just because, I mean, no offense to you who asked that. It's just, I, I feel questions like that for these types of films tend to be- um, Zero stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zero yeah. stars. <laughs> okay. Um, so Terry, a question for Julia is asking, what drew you to the script and what made you want to do the film? I, mean, I think that was sort of covered at the beginning, but uh, maybe not quite. Yeah, um, a lot of it was Sarah as a character, um, that kind of activeness that she has and the fact that she is, she's such a powerful, uh, she, she causes a story to happen rather than being a victim of the circumstances. Um, that's definitely what, what drew me to the character. Um, I think, yeah, other than that, um, I think it's, it's, part of also what Anthony kind of just touched on about um, the symbolism in it and the questions that that the film asks about these kind of symbols that are that are shared across humanity and uh, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of layers of those kinds of questions and uh, psychological questions and I, I also very much like the ambiguity of it and the fact that everybody is going to experience it differently everybody's mm -hmm. going to have different uh different questions about it and different assumptions um and different ways to to relate to it as well i think that's that's a really cool thing about films in general but um yeah it, it definitely that definitely intrigued me about the script great Hey, I love the, the way it touches on primordial dreams and memories. Mm -hmm. So fantastic. Well, yeah, um, if I may say. You may say. <laughs> what I was going to say, that's a great touch, touch, touching off point for what I, I believe is sort of our duty as filmmakers sometimes is in this new world and, you know, marketplace of, of movies. Um, I used to love leaving the movies not knowing what just happened sometimes. Yeah, same. And now that things are made a certain way and they're made by committee or they, they, you know, there's a sort of middle of the road budget where these movies came from and that no longer exists. We just wanted to make a movie that felt that way. Mm -hmm. You know, like that gave us that feeling that when you went to the cinema, you walked out and you weren't spoon fed something and it gave you something to think about or entertained you plus made you feel a certain way, you know? And, and so we took it upon ourselves to try and make that kind of movie. The ambiguity is a secret sauce to really haunting people's dreams with art. I, I feel. For <laughs> um, Kagaline Roy has another great question. Uh, where did you get the amazing design ideas for the sleeping suit? 
Are there some films that inspired you for the aesthetic of the film, production design, the lab tech retro design, uh, imagery of shadow figures, cinematography, lighting? Oh. <laughs> so You again, Anthony. <laughs> so those suits were actually made uh, by Evan Bedell, who is a Project Runway um, winner uh, from Canada. He's mm -hmm. a lovely designer. And they're, they're sort of based on some sketches that I sent him. And I think for me, um, again, ambiguity, I, I wanted these suits to, to sort of feel like familiar and, and but, but you had no idea how they worked. <laughs> and, and, and sort of, there, there's a little bit of, of nonsense in that that I miss from movies. You know, when someone comes and puts on some sort of suit and it, you just take it, let's use Ghostbusters as a great example, the PK. Yeah, fantastic Voyage. Yeah, exactly. Who knows what that thing does, but it looks scientific and great. It yeah. registers beautifully. Yes, and, and this suit is very similar in that we wanted something that, that doesn't really make modern sense for what it's doing, but that's part of what makes it the unknown, you know? Mm -hmm. and so it gives you the, the clue that something's going on. So Evan came up with these and, and built these amazing suits, uh, but they are based on sketches that for me, are semi-based on the work of uh, the comic artist uh, Mobius. Mm. I've, I've, I, I've always shared, uh, so when I was younger, I just, I could not stop sketching things like like what he came up with. He was an absolute genius. And so uh, that's always just been in my mind that I, I, I mean, every, every costume I ever want in a movie should be, <laughs> honestly, from, the, from a Mobius comic. <laughs> they're just they're just so lovely so so for me i was hugely inspired by movies right on antoine asks which analog synths or vsti's do you use for the soundtrack uh, looking isn't this i love this new modern world where where people are <laughs> looking the preset i use <laughs> uh, question though uh funny enough uh i was lucky enough to to be married to an amazing woman who got me for Christmas uh, a Moog One, and anyone who knows what that is, <laughs> be jealous now. And that was that was the that was the, the primary uh, instrument for the soundtrack was the Moog One. Uh, I, I would stay up late and make my own presets. Um, so all, all of my cues, the Moog One, and now on the electric youth side of it, I can't speak for them, but I know it was also equally awesome synthesizer but almost all i think both of us we stuck in the actual analog realm as opposed to vsts so excellent uh michael wilson says this is more a statement than a question but it's a good one uh i work in film in edmonton i saw when you came to town in 2000 2017 i know how hard it is to make a movie so full with such passion for a low budget i just want to say i'm happy to see it finished as a great movie Thank hey. you so much, man. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's a great, yeah, thank yeah. you. That, that means a lot. It, and, Antoine, by the way, just responded <laughs> to, your, to, your, to the Moog with nice, many, many, many eyes. Yeah. <laughs> nice. nice. That's great. Uh, Kat asks, or, or yeah, asks, love seeing pieces of Edmonton in the film. What made you decide to film it? Well, I grew up in Edmonton. And oh, did you? Okay. Uh, always felt... Uh, a little strange to me in the good in a good way mm -hmm. um, in a creative way uh there's an underground to edmonton there's a, there's an oddness to edmonton that people don't really sort of see from the outside that if you live here and you work as an artist here in town you get to see it there's a passion here and i thought it would really fuel and help because we are a low budget production i knew that we would get the support necessary to to, to get through it and and to, to have the, you know the art artists and you know crafts people who could help us get through that with such a limited budget and so that's why we came here i mean we were able to get locations and, and things that we just would not it would have been impossible elsewhere so it was really really logistical but also i wanted to shoot we the guys will remember, everyone on the team will remember, uh, we shot a lot of stuff where I grew up and I wanted it that way so that I understood the emotionality of what we were trying to get. So you know, makes sense. whether it's the park, you know, where she wakes up or whatever, these are places I grew up around. And 
That's that's the best. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the late night yeah. gunshot. Remember that? Was there a gunshot mid production? <laughs> They're like, yeah. So in one, in, in one, in one, yeah. yeah. One night we were out. I had forgotten, but thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> Shot for about like four weeks straight overnight, and I think one of the last nights uh, at about three or four in the morning in uh, a nice community that Anthony was where from, I, where I grew up. Uh, we we're walking one of the walking scenes, and you just hear gunshots uh, in the. Uh, it's very just, close distance. Yeah, and then a helicopter and a spotlight. Yeah, it's fun. Was it, it was did, didn't, yeah. didn't a guy like pee outside of the with the donut, the coffee shop when we were there? That Like there's yeah. just a guy came up, he's like, ah, oh, and he just peed outside. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. There's a, there's a flavor here that is yeah. important. <laughs> it's like, like honestly, like, I'm, I, I don't know about you, Mitch, but, and everyone else, like, I'm just sick of movies looking so... Similar? Clean. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we really wanted to make a movie where you didn't see the CN Tower in the background. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Props to that, yeah. <laughs> Definitely, streets that don't seem to be vacuumed are as good. So, yes. Edmonton was awesome. Yeah. Couldn't have made the movie without it. Not at all. Yeah. Cool. That sounds like a great city to shoot in. So, Megan asked, oh, I love the dream oh, sequence. Yeah. Yeah. This is our place. It's closed. It's closed. <laughs> <laughs> Don't come. Yeah. Yeah. I dig. I so realize this is close to a question that had been uh, answered already. Um, yeah. Uh, so here, we'll close on this. Uh, another question from Kevin Lynn. Uh, Landon, can you talk a little bit about your approach on building the in-between link character of Jeremy that seems connected to both worlds in a sense, being in a coma, being involved in the experiment, having connections with the outside doctor? Uh, that's uh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I I never looked at it as an in between character. I suppose. I mean, in, in order to you know sort of authentically play him, I couldn't play into the 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 idea that he, you know he was an in between or that he was maybe not you know um, that he was maybe a, well, I, th there was never any any conversation about you know whether this part was a dream or this part was the coma there was never any of that it was just what is Jeremy going through in that moment and 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 you know kind of what we said earlier about Jeremy and that he's doing very questionable things um but he's doing it in a in a uh, in a way that he feels is very important mm -hmm. uh, and so that was always the most important thing is is that that conflict with Jeremy of well th this is something that's very important to him but he's also kind of dealing with the consequences of it and so um I yeah it was it was always about playing into the authenticity of what he was going through um rather than this sort of in-betweenness <laughs> right yeah. Not good. I, would, I would never tell anybody when things happen or if they even do happen. That's a good approach for this kind of film, definitely. It's funny in the, in that mode too. It's uh, this is a little bit unrelated, but like this is the the second time I've gotten to watch the film, and, and this time I got to watch it as like a film. Like the first time I got to watch it as an experience, and this time I got to watch it as and and there were moments where I was like, when did Anthony shoot that? <laughs> like there was moments where I was like, when did he oh, out of body? I know that we shot it over this period of time but i was like when did he get that shot i just it, was, it blew my mind <laughs> excellent you know so before we close i should ask this anthony uh what what are you working on now if you're able to talk about any new projects uh, either in cinema or music uh well i got i i did a score um this last year um for another independent filmmaker um uh and that'll be coming out uh tell you guys about later <laughs> uh, and so 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 that'll be coming out um probably in the next year um and we're looking at locations now oh good yeah are you so you're in pre-production on something what? okay yeah, yeah don't pre, curse anything pre, 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 pre but you know yeah. uh when when i'm writing i like to to go out and look at places because i, I think it's important to 
when you're working within a budget to not have this grand idea, but work within the confines of what you know you have um, mm -hmm. or what you know you can get. So, so I often will go up and sort of just as a pre sort of cursor to the, the full script, just make sure that we can get all the things that we need. So, yeah. Okay. So, and, and it takes place in 1870. Really? Yes. That's going to be interesting. Yes. And yet, and you're looking. You're looking for. Are you looking at exterior locations? What kind of locations could you be looking at for a period piece? <laughs> ah, cool. <Okay. laughs> we will talk. But that that sounds fantastic, man. Well, congratulations on this. Yeah. I love the movie. Uh, I can't wait to see it just tear out into the world because I think people are really going to respond big. It's so powerful. It connects with people. I mean, we 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 all worked really hard to try and make something that was different. Um, this team that was on this film, everyone believed in it, I, I hope, <laughs> and, and, and put their all into it. And we had, like I said, we had a very small core group of people who just really wanted to do something different and special. And, and, and I'm, I'm blessed to have all my friends and all of you here uh, support my vision and for all you people over there watching it. Like it's, 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 it's a dream come true for all of us. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much. And something special you've made. Well, thank you, Mitch. And I hope next time we can be in person and I will zone out for the first 10 minutes there too. And then we'll see you fully come to life. It's so. so okay. Don't worry about it. But yeah, a physical cinema space, shared experience, lots of human beings reacting at once, all the cerebellums together in one physical area. Right, <laughs> through the roof. <laughs> yeah, right. fuck this apocalypse thing. Uh, all right. How are you everything and we'll talk soon. <laughs> Have a good night. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.